that I've flown from the ATR-102 back into Pro Tools. It's never in time hmm. by the end of the song. By the end of the three-minute song, it's going ba 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 they're, they're flaming, and they're never in yeah. time. So that's something that we like. I know it's weird, but I think that's... No, that makes a lot of sense. It's like, it's organic, you film know? Is exactly what, the, film is exactly the same. Anytime you right. can introduce a mechanical device into the recording, it's better. And that was the Jack White thing. That's what he was all about. He was just all about like, you know, if we got Pro Tools. Yeah, it's easy to have 100 tracks. I don't want 100 tracks. I want it to be hard. I want us to make those eight tracks count. Like every track count, you know? Okay, but like he's also like, okay, cool. Hey, can you turn the snare up? And I'm like, uh, okay, cool. So I would set up the automation because we had an automation computer and I'd play the track back. And every time the snare would, someone hit the snare, I'd turn it up a dB. So boop, bam, boop, bam, boop, bam, boop, bam, boop, bam. You know, that was how we turned the snare drum up. Oh, you want more hi-hat? Here's some 10K. The fact of the matter is, is once it's recorded and once it's there, if it feels right, it is right, period. You know, you can make all kinds of things about, you know, oh, well, I recorded 25 tracks. I mean, I get mixes all the time that have 25 drum tracks. And I'm just like, which one of these 25 is the one you want me to use? Because basically all of them add up to something, but they add up to something that is so full of chaos. I I don't know that I can get exactly what you ever wanted back. Yeah. Also, when there's so many sources, like they just become less important. You know, when you have a few important sources, you can make them sound really big and full instead of just cutting away and just leaving just a time. Oh, we have acoustic guitars in this massive track. Let's just, you're basically only going to hear 6K. You know what I mean? It's not. Yeah. Well, you know, um, just because we can doesn't mean we should, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of a, uh, you know, one thing that's strange that he would be the person to tell me this, but one of the things that Trey said that was really brilliant, he said that when he was in music school, his composition teacher told him the most important part of the pencil was the eraser. (laughs) Wow. Love which, that. which I thought was pretty brilliant. And I've been sort of doing that lately. Uh, yeah. Um, I've been, you know, like, hey, let's figure out a way to have less tracks on this record. Let's press mute. Yeah. Like we don't need we don't need we don't need two guitars to play through the whole song. You know what I mean? We just totally, don't. Totally. It's, it's interesting. I, I mean, I love what you said. It's just, you know, these days there's so little budget for, uh, in terms of like, you know, the three things that are important for records that we love like these days the budgets are getting lower and lower the time you know we don't have time everyone's cranking things out like how do you work in a in a world that that looks like the the current world we're we're working in you know i've been doing it long enough now for better for worse that there's a little bit of an infrastructure under me i mean i have a manager in la i have a business manager you know i'm at a clientele level that obviously they're they're cool with pay my day rate. Um, totally. But how do I do records that I want to do, which maybe don't have budgets? We just have to figure out a way to partner with the, with the artist, you know? Um, there's a band that I'm, I'm working with right now uh, from upstate New York called the Bobby Lees. You know, I just went to him and I said, look, I love you guys. I think you guys are really cool and I want to make a record with you. But, you know, I know that you're not going to, you don't have a record deal and let I'll how about we just go in and have these and we'll just make this record together and you know I'll uh uh whatever whatever the record makes we'll split it you know like that kind of vibe you know yeah or I or really the reality for me was I want to work towards getting this record finding somebody to sign you and find somebody who wants to put money behind you and get you out on the road and working and then they can buy the record and it's no big deal. I mean, I, I, I just made it so my normal fee is, what you know what I mean? Like they would just have to pay the normal fee, not something stupid, you know? And I'm not trying to write their songs or any of that bullshit, you know? But um, we just have to, mm-hmm. like, there are bands that, that we have to adjust, you know? Yeah, you just take a, take, you're taking a chance on them, you know? Yeah. And then there's, you know, there's people who keep calling me to do stuff that, they have the money to do it, so that fine that finances. We, you know, our business our business is based on the rent gig. 
you know, uh, the you know what the mm. rent gig is, right? That's a gig. The you rent, the rent gig, the rent gig. That's the gig yeah. you don't really care about, you don't really love, but it pays your rent. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like it pays yeah, for the sure. it, it pays the rent. At, at, Absolutely. You know, at, at one point, I had taken out a loan on this console, and I'd taken a loan to buy this console, and and I had shuffled a a, a bunch of my IRA into building this room. And, you know, I was, I mean, my overhead was about 12 grand a month, (laughs) you know, and it was, and that's, you know, almost a thousand dollars a month for electricity, you know, and it's like, and then, and then (laughs) I running that much gear and then I have an assistant, you know, I have an assistant that I, I pay really well. And, um, and so, you know, I'm paying his day rate and paying the paying the mortgage and paying the electric bill and paying insurance. You know, you got to have a couple million dollars of insurance. You know, in case somebody trips and falls down. Sure. And um, blah blah blah, and also trying to figure out how to buy gear and make and make smart gear decisions. You know what I mean? I don't really buy mm-hmm. anything I don't use. You know. Um, the cool thing is I, I pretty much have kind of done buying gear. I'm, I'm pretty much over that, you know, don't really need to do <laughs> that anymore. Um, you got over your gas. Well, it wasn't that. It was just at some point I looked around and I said, okay, cool. I have, I, I have got every, it all. <laughs> I, I have every tool that I want and every tool that I need. And Amazing. those two things are different. You, you want gear and then you need gear. There's, totally. you know, you, you need mic preamps, you know, to record things, right? You need, you know, compressors to compress things, you, you know, you need things, but you know, like I didn't need that. I wanted that. You mm. know what I mean? What the undertone. Yeah. The, the unfair child. So yeah. I didn't need it. I just wanted it. I finally got to a point where I could use it. Here's the funny part. I use it all the time now, uh, recording Chris Stapleton's vocals. So now I need it. <laughs> yeah. Which is, uh, which it's is, funny uh, how that works, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's exactly yeah. right. So, yeah, one, one of those Love things. It. What's your approach to, to monitoring? Uh, do, you know, what, how are you listening to music when you're mixing? And uh, are you referencing? Uh, I don't, I never reference anything else. I don't reference records that are comparison. Uh, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. Totally. Yeah. And so, um, I remember one time having a client be like, I want you to listen to this, um, you know, John Mayer record, uh, continuum because I want my record to sound like that. And I'm like, I'm not going to do it. If you want your record (laughs) to sound like that. First of all, you need to be John Mayer. Second, you need to hire Steve Jordan. Exactly. And you need to go to that studio and have him produce your record. Yeah. I'm not going to copy. I'm not, I'm not, well, yeah, I'm not going to copy this. You know what I mean? Like, no. Totally. He's like, well, no, I just want it to sound like it. I go, well, that's cool. You made this record for 15 grand somewhere. It's not going to sound like that John Mayer record. <laughs> it's just not, you know, and yeah. and that's what I told him. You know, I'm just like, you know, comparison's the thief of joy, man. You know, like you want to compare yourself to this, you will be disappointed over and over again. Forget this. Yes. Just just make your let's just make your record. Let's make it sound like you. So yeah, um, that's a really important point, also for younger engineers, because you know, people we get so hung up about like what other people are doing and how they're mixing and what it sounds like and. You know, if you don't have the material they're working with and if you don't have their songs and you don't have their ears, you're not going to sound like them. You just have to, you know, double down on sounding like you and sounding like the artists you're working with. You know, what right. I mean? Right. Well, you, you know, so uh, but what I what I do do, <laughs> you said do do uh, what I do <laughs> do is I listen to things that I know really well. Mm-hmm. So, like, if we go to a studio that I. I'm not hip to, or we go to some place. I usually always bring my own speakers and amp, or I rent a set of these set speakers and amp, and then I'll listen. I'll just put it, put some music on, listen, and walk around, and kind of figure out if they're doing what I expect them to do. And then, you know, I've, I mean, we've had to like 
you know, put them on a brick or put them up on a stand, you know, an ISO pad or, you know what I mean, to figure out what the control room's doing that so it works like mine or whatever. Um, I have, yeah. uh, I, m- most of my monitoring is ProAC uh, AC100s or, you know, Studio 100s. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, this is what they're called, Studio 100s. And then Bryson 4Bs. And then um, I have a set of NS10s um, uh, over here. I have a set of NS10s and I have them backwards. So I have them inside out. So I have the tweeters oh, on the okay. inside. And they're about – they're about a foot apart, the tweeters, uh, right in front of my face. Um, mm. And I do, uh, I do the, uh, I take a Kleenex, which is a three ply, and I peel the plies apart. So very, mm-hmm. very, very thin. I just tape that over the tweeter. Now I'm not trying to do the clear mountain thing or anything like that. But what I'm doing is I'm shaping the tone of the speaker so that it's more like a shitty speaker than as shitty as the NS10 already is. I'm making it shittier because what I want to do is I want to listen to that speaker with the top end cut off, the bottom end cut off, kind of like an oratone, right? Mm -hmm. And sort of get it, get the mix to sound good on those quiet. And then because they're so narrow with the tweeters here and the woofers out here, if I can get that mix to sound this wide, I'm winning. Mm. You know what I mean? I'm winning. So, yeah. um, so yeah, and I mix, uh, quite quiet. So, um, maybe, uh, uh, I'd say 85 to start and then 75 and ended at, at about 70 mm. on the NS10s. So 75 and 70 is on the NS10s, 85 is on the Prax. Now. Okay. Now. You do have a set of big speakers. I have a set of um, atomic reactors that were made by this mad scientist in Detroit named Norman Druce. Now, Norman's no longer with us. He passed away last year. Oh, um, I, I heard about him from uh, from Rick Barnes, yeah. I think. Yeah, he's, he was a mad genius. Uh, mm-hmm. He built these speakers. These are the first set of speakers he ever built. Mine are the protos. Um, and in typical Norman fashion... He put a mid-range in that uh, is custom-made. So the only way I can replace these mid-range drivers is by a <laughs> hundred of them, which would be forty thousand dollars. Holy shit! Did you but, do that? No, <laughs> no, I don't need to replace them. But um, yeah. they're they're just a two-way speaker. They're a full-range speaker with a sub. <laughs> they sound amazing. They're big. Wow. I mean, they are definitely big. And I will start a mix there. And that's probably 95 or so. Wow. So you start on the big speakers, then you move it into the Pro Axe. Yeah. And then the rest of the record is done on the NS10s. Yep. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Pro- yeah. I feel like most people start on the NS10s and then move the other way around. You know what I mean? They start with the uh, shit and then they kind of well, I mean, bring out the full. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, I mean, for me, it's like put them up on the bigs. Make it sound great, loud, and lo- like loud, right? Mm. And then when you come down, mm-hmm. then you want to make it sound as big as you can. You know what I mean? Just make it sound really good loud. If it sounds really good loud, it's not hurting you and doesn't make you want to you know, reach for the volume knob. Um, Chris Stapleton, actually, he is really good. Here's the thing. He's like, I want people to reach for the volume knob to turn it up, not yeah. down. He oh, goes, yeah. if it's... If I if it makes me want to turn it down, we're doing something wrong. And so, um, you know, I I it's weird. He said that, and I was like, oh yeah, well, I wish I would have said that. But I didn't. That was him. So. Yeah, we could segue from there into mastering. I, you told me before we started recording that you have a a go to mastering engineer. Yeah, yeah uh, I, have a, I have a couple. Um, Pete Lyman mm-hmm. uh, at Infrasonics. Mm-hmm. He's here in town now. We're friends. We're buddies. He's been doing a lot of my work. Uh, Chris Athens, who is like oh, the yeah. biggest mastering guy on the planet, is a good friend of mine. Uh, mm-hmm. I love that guy. You know, I just I just love him. I love everything about him. You know, he told me one time that uh, we we went out we we went out in one of our I don't know AES or something, um, and he was like, uh, "Just stick close to me." You know, I've always got bail money in my pocket. 
So, <laughs> yeah. Because I've always got bail money for you in my pocket. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is hilarious. But 